Geico presents sharing versus oversharing. Today, Bridget Griffin shared a video of her daily yoga routine, two self-help articles, and her new blog called Build Your Inner Bridge with Bridge. Girl, your sharing has turned into oversharing. No worries, Bridge. Geico has some info worth sharing with your seven blog followers, like how you could save money on your car insurance, update your policy, and report a claim just by visiting geico.com. How's that for building your inner bridge? Bridge, Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Blog Talk Radio. We are the UR Tennis Network. Our mission is to be the voice of tennis. We enlist a team of passionate enthusiasts to promote our sport. We strive to bring interesting perspectives on the many spins of tennis. Our goal is to provide the learners of our sport with current news and information from many angles. We seek active participation from communities interested in tennis, but tennis is not interested in them. We are expanding our outreach. Tennis is a true lifetime sport that needs to be talked about, and the UR Tennis Network pledges to pursue this idea relentlessly. Good morning and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, coming at you from Atlanta. It is a gorgeous day here, freezing, freezing, but gorgeous and sunny and blue skies. So um, I'm happy that I am in the coziness of my little office here and uh, not on the tennis court right this second. But um, more power to those of you braving the elements out there. We have a fantastic show for you all today. Frank Giampaolo is with us. Frank has been on the show before. Uh, Those of you who follow Parenting Aces are very familiar with Frank, I'm sure, because I post stuff from him all the time. And what's pretty cool is Frank has written a book called The Tennis Parents Bible. And the first edition came out, I think, about six years ago, five or six years ago. And he has just released a new second edition of the book, which is why I thought this was the perfect time to have him back on the show. And so I'm really looking forward to picking his brain about why he felt the need to update the book, what's changed in the the arena of parent education and junior tennis, and, you know, why why he felt like there was a need to maybe – update or change what he initially put out to his readers and uh, he he does a lot of work traveling all over the world actually speaking to parents speaking to coaches and working one-on-one not just with junior players themselves but also with the families of the players so he really has a great perspective to offer from the coaching side he's a parent himself so He knows firsthand about what it takes to bring kids up through this junior tennis journey and and can speak to that. So I think there's going to be a lot of great information out there for us today, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with all of you. Before I bring Frank on, I want to play a quick commercial, but when we come back, we're going to have Frank Giampaolo telling us about his latest edition of the Tennis Parents Bible. Warning. Orthopedic surgeons are seeing an increase in overuse injuries when young athletes perform the same repetitive, repetitive stressful motions over and over. Oh, oh, over. <laughs> Pitching, tennis, weight training, even long swimming workouts can cause overuse trauma that may require surgery. If your kids play and train hard, visit orthoinfo.org or stopsportsinjuries.org. A message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. Welcome back to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm Lisa Stone, and I want to just give you all the number in case you are listening live and would like to call in and chat with us today. That number is 714-583-6853. Again, 714-583-6853. 6853. And without further ado, I want to bring on today's guest, Frank Giampaolo. Frank, thank you so much for being with us today. I know it's early on the West Coast, but I appreciate you taking time out to join Parenting Aces. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hey, Lee. Yeah, no, no problem. It's fun to be here. It's a 
Yeah, it's 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 cold here too. It's going to be like sixty in Laguna Beach today. So, oh, we're freezing oh. here in California. Oh. <laughs> oh, I feel for you. Yeah. I know. <laughs> no, but I've been traveling in the in the frozen tundra, so I it is good to be home and thaw out a little bit. Thanks it's for having funny, me. My, you're welcome. My my oldest daughter, who lives in Los Angeles, is actually here in Atlanta for three months, and she is her blood has definitely thinned since moving yeah. out there. She is miserable, cold right now, so. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's pretty brutal right this minute here. But anyway, yeah. I I'm so uh, excited you could do the show, and I'm so thrilled that you know you you took the time to update Tennis Parents Bible, and and I'm really looking forward to kind of picking your brain about the impetus behind doing a second edition. And I one of the things that I read in Actually, I think the intro to the book that just really jumped out at me, and I, I want to read it because if I try to paraphrase it, I'll mess it up, and you worded it really well. Um, but I, I want to start our conversation around the following, and, and this is what you wrote. Most parents spend 100% of their time, money, and energy on developing their child's fundamental strokes. Yet in competitive match play, athletes blame their lack of results on mental and emotional issues. I have never heard a top-ranked junior walk off the court and cry, if only I had followed through higher, I would have beaten that guy. What we do here day in and day out is, I can't stand playing retrievers, or I was hooked out of the match, or I was up again 5-2 and choked, or I'm so bad. I love that that passage, Frank, and and I want to just use that as an entree into our conversation today. Can can you elaborate on what is going on out there in the junior tennis world that we as parents feel the need to spend really a majority of our resources on stroke production, like you said, tennis fundamentals, stroke fundamentals, and yet ignore all the other pieces that go into making a tennis player. Well, that's crazy, isn't it? it um, I, I really do find there's a disconnect, and, and even way back in the first, you know, Tennis Parent Bible five years ago when, when I was a tennis parent as well, um, that was the, the crazy cry we would hear all the time from, from junior tennis players, but... Uh, you know, but then parents would, would book their kids back into a lesson and they'd go and the coach would feed the ball right to them and work on technical form. But um, the um, in the beginning, what I tried to do was uh, different types of charts. We all have the, you know, the uh, the iPhones and the uh, the apps and the, the great unforced error to winner charts. But for me, it was always looking deeper into everything. So it's not just the fact that Johnny made 20 unforced errors on his backhand, but what's the cause of the errors? And as I got into it more and more, there's, there's four causes out there, parents that are listening or coaches. Um, we can categorize, this is a cause of error chart, but we can categorize errors from reckless shot selection, poor movement and spacing to the ball. That could cause errors. Of course, technical is a cause of errors, especially at the lower levels. And then poor emotional conduct, performance anxieties can really kind of block everything, every type of motor program. So um, back about, geez, 15, 15 years ago, we started to you know, look at that. And, and my background came from stroke mechanics. I was a, a, my very first job, I was a tennis pro at the Vic Braden Tennis College. I became a director of his colleges. We opened schools. And it was basically stroke production. Um, but the more we got to, you know, spend time with the top players, they really didn't talk about just fundamental strokes anymore. So that was the whole idea. It's interesting. The Bible. Right. I mean, it's interesting that, that you come from a Vic Braden background because Vic was one of the first tennis professionals to use video, right? I mean, he was – Yes. Yep. He was one of the first ones to integrate video analysis and videotaping players and breaking down strokes. And for those who tuned in to last week's show, I had Peter Rochich on the show, and, 
and Peter is, you know, really into video analysis these days and and using video analysis from actual tournament match play as opposed to just during lessons so that he can pick up on the exact things that you mentioned, Frank, you know, looking at movement, looking at the emotional component, and looking at shot selection, not just the mechanics of the forehand and the backhand. Yeah, well, I, I highly recommend that, too. I think he's he's right on the money. When when you have parents that understand their role, they're actually videotaping matches, at least one match per tournament, and then they can bring that home and a high IQ tennis coach can quantify the, the data. They can sit with the athlete. And I mean, the list is so long, but, you know, controlling the energy flow of a match and the length of peak performance of a player, we've all had players and we've all gone through it too. We, we play like a pro for three games and then we give the next three games back. Uh, so there's so many, there's so many intricate little details that you could pick up if you're videotaping matches. Um, but but around the world, I must say, I still see the old school videotaping fundamental strokes, stationary fundamental strokes. But um, I like to pick up things like, is the player spotting mega points or game points? Are they understanding this is a positive game point, like being up 40-15? Or is it a negative game point? You're down 40-15, and you have to play different types of game points differently. Um there's a lot of fun little elements we can pick up. And so, yeah, that's right on the money, videotaping matches. When you say high IQ coach, can you define that? Well, I think it's a coach that is continually doing their homework. They're, they're passionate about the game. They're so passionate that they're researching. Um, I don't know, maybe guys like me, maybe we're a little bit nuts, but we're always looking for – the next answer is we're always looking to go deeper. And that's one of the important things that I, uh, that I look for. There, there is a chapter in the, in the new book about how to hire a coach, what type of coach, um, how to spot a high IQ coach. Um, probably one of the biggest keys in a high IQ coach is a coach that, that starts with asking a ton of questions is that the coach wants to know things like athletic ability or past athletic ability. They want to know things like, you know, personality profiling that's so important in developing a player, um, the player's goals. Um, so to me, especially for parents out there, if you sit down with a, a brand new coach, in my opinion, the coach should be analyzing a match, maybe on video or live, pay the coach to go put together a game plan, review the game plan first, um, I always recommend go observe a coach teaching before you pay them for lessons. So if there's an academy you think you might like, don't tell anybody you're coming. Just go sneak out and watch the coaches interact with all the players. And you can tell within 10 minutes if it's a great program or not. So, right. so anyway, do your homework like that, you know? Well, you know, it's it's so challenging with tennis because there are – so many different levels to play the game, right? So there's there are the kids that get involved in the in the sport because they're looking for an activity, and you know tennis is social. They may sign up with a couple friends and take a group lesson, and then they maybe join a league, you know, with their buddies and you know play one match a week yeah. um, in a team format, and that's as far as they want to go with the with the sport, and that's. Awesome, because I would wager that those are the kids that are still playing at 70 and 80 years old at a much <laughs> higher rate um, than ones like my kid and your kid. I think the rate of burnout and dropout is a lot higher in the kids who really get serious at a young age and, and work very hard and then, you know, maybe stick with it through high school or even through college and, and then are like, oh, my God, yeah. I never want to touch a racket again. <laughs> um, and and then there's that next level, which are the kids who are aspiring to a professional career. And, 
you know, I've certainly had parents of, of those players on the show. I've had Steve Johnson, who I know, you know, provided an interview in your book. Um, I've had Noah Rubin's mom, Melanie, on. I've had Gail Pitts Black, who's mom to um, Tornado and Hurricane Black and Nicole Pitts. And so, I mean, I've had several professionals. I've, had, I've interviewed Andy Murray's mom. It, it's a very different pathway when your child and and as a an adjunct to that, the whole family is focused on getting that child to the professional level. So, you know, I would wager that most of the listeners of Parenting Aces, most of the readers of Parenting Aces, fall somewhere between the recreational and the college-bound player. Um, very few are are really totally focused on professional tennis because we all know the percentages for success at that level are minuscule. But so your book, though, really does touch on all of those different areas. I mean, it's it's appropriate for the parents of the rec player, the college-bound player, and the professionally-bound player, right? Well, I hope so. That that was the goal. It took about two and a half years to, to write this book, and it is big. I, I must say that the table of content is 10 pages. The book is about 500 <laughs> So right. it, it's it's definitely a big book, but I crazy. I'm already having families contact me that say they read it all in one night. So that's that's a passionate parent right there. But um, to me, the disconnect with with um, with the levels is is when a parent sees the tennis game in their job description as as a hobby. They're a hobbyist, but yet they get really upset when their kid doesn't win every tournament. Well, mm-hmm. to to me, it's interesting that you, you can't be a hobbyist parent and expect to get more than just a hobbyist child. That's what you're going to get. So, part of educating right, can explain parents that. Is, explain that um, a little deeper because I've I've read that from you and I've heard you say that, and I think that's a really really crucial message for parents to hear. Well. The tennis parent, I think, has to look at this as uh, whatever their goals might be. If, for example, their goal is D1 college, well, as you know, and, and most parents out there know, college coaches, they don't really see it as a free ride. They see giving a scholarship as a job. It's a 30-hour-a-week job that the child's going to be performing for the school to win for the school, and parents have to understand that as well. They have to understand they're prepping their child for a job. So it's really not free. Um, and there's so many job descriptions of a tennis parent or, or any sport. And then, and then we've got to be fair. If you're going to be high performance in equestrian or paintball, it's serious business nowadays. It doesn't matter the sport. And so I think it's important that parents have a plan. And it is customized. And part of that plan is developing an entourage of all the different types of coaches. The parents have to understand their actual job descriptions, like all the logistical job descriptions, the financials, uh, the emotional job descriptions. That's off the hook. There's, I have just, I have just pages on parental job descriptions and uh, parent player harmony and the negative parental behaviors to avoid and, obviously how to plan tournament schedules and weekly training schedules and periodization training, understanding the tournament cycles. And this is all just part of the tennis parent job description chapter. But in this day and age, in my opinion, you can't be a hobbyist. You can't just throw the kid a baseball mitt and then a basketball two months later and think the kid's even going to play high school ball because they're not. They're not even going to make the high school team unless they're crazy serious about it nowadays. So um, it's a different world for sure than when we were all growing up. Right. And, I, you know, like it or not, it is the reality. And, I mean, we can we could spend this hour talking about why it's bad that youth sports have taken this turn. And believe yeah. me, there are plenty of articles out there and plenty of, coaches and other professionals out there talking about how bad it is. But 
it is our reality, as you said. And if you are going to put your child into the world of junior sports, whether it's tennis or anything, if you don't understand the environment that you're getting involved in, there's no way to succeed in it. So, you know, for those of you listening that say, but but this is not what I want for my child, okay, I get that, and there are plenty of forums where you can get involved to start instigating change in the way that you sports a run, but the reality right this minute is this is how it works, and if you don't understand it and you don't take an active role, then you really are setting everybody up for failure and and you're spinning your wheels and 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 spending money unnecessarily honestly yeah um, no it's true and i, I and, hate and you, i hate to be the bearer of that <laughs> of that message but but it's the ugly truth of the way things are are going right now yeah and, and you know what really goals change i mean you get a parent that is totally uninvolved in sports and they First of all, I, I've never once in 30 years, I've never heard a parent say, look, can you make my child incredibly average? They don't say that. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they, they, the kid actually gets get some skills. Now they start competing a little bit in you know local events. They start finding a little bit of success. And now guess what? Their goals change. Now they say, well, now we want to we want to make the team. And then if they make the high school team, we want to possibly play college. And as they get more and more into the process, they realize that they can do it. And I've seen over and over around the world that there's just millions of kids with the athletic ability to be great at tennis and just to laugh their guts out and enjoy the game, but they don't have a plan. They just don't have parents or even coaches that can help them organize their you know, their customized developmental plan. But once they get organized, they really tend to maximize their potential at, at a really fast rate. So your your kid probably is good enough. They just need a plan. They just need to get organized. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. what I'm seeing around the world. Yeah. Well, you're right. You're right. So you you put out the original version of the Tennis Parents Bible uh, five years ago. Is that right? Yeah, Six it was ago? about, five, yeah. about five years ago. Yeah. Okay, and and in the last year or so, you decided, you know what, it's time for an update. What spurred you to write the updates? Was it something you saw? Was it something that you heard? I, you know, what what prompted you to go back to the drawing board and we re- redo the book? Well, I. I was pleasantly surprised when the first book hit um, a bunch of the bestsellers list. So then that was the first thing that encouraged me that parents want information. Parents are seeking it. And um, the second thing is, is as I, as I traveled and the book got a little bit more successful, um, I traveled to different parts of the world, worked with all the ITF coaches and the groups um, from Australia, New Zealand, Israel, Canada, whatever. But we we found that everybody's experiencing the same problems everywhere around the world. And um, I I also found that the book, the initial book, didn't quite go deep enough in parents understanding, you know, the science of match day preparation and how the child has to morph into an athletic warrior, not just warm up for five minutes and go play. There's – there's so many elements just to that topic alone. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about this before, but the mental and the emotional components. Um, and, and to me out there, the mental is the X's and O's of strategies and tactics, how to beat boom ball pushers, um, things like that. Understanding your own personal top seven patterns, understanding how to do what you do best. That's part of the mental. And the emotional is more performance anxiety how to close out leads, um, how to handle gamesmanship. And so I'm finding that that's a huge topic. That's one of the most important um, reasons why children lose matches. But, but then we're finding, looking with coaches, coaches are not teaching that. Uh, and parents are not teaching that. And nobody is teaching it. And mm-hmm. so the, the poor kids, he's, he's out on a ledge. 
by himself in the middle of a match. So, um, I mean, unless the parents want to, you know, hire, like I said before, a high IQ coach that understands all these components and is willing to teach all these components. Um, a big disconnect to me is the parent that'll pay for their kid to go to two clinics a week or academies nowadays, we call it, and maybe one private. And the coach is working on, you know, a kick serve and, and the kids rallying back and forth. It's kind of grooving in the academy. Um, but that might not be why the child's losing matches. So there's all those little disconnects. And that's kind of what urged me to take notes. Every day I'm talking into my iPhone. Um, I'm listing all the questions. Uh, we have chapters and chapters of all the, all the questions. And uh, interesting, the, the leader of Tennis Brazil told me, these are all the exact questions I've heard for 50 years but nobody's ever bothered to write them down and answer them. So mm-hmm. the most common questions and solutions. So we, you know, we dug into that a little bit more too, which um, all the different practice session dramas and competitive dramas. And so we had a lot of fun with it. It's a what, crazy what's world. Your... I got to tell you. <laughs> that is true. What What's your thought about, how important match play is to the whole, the whole, you know, well, development no process. Point. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's it's a missing link, really. Um, so many kids, I, I must say, they're out there grooving in their academies back and forth, but they're not practicing competing. And uh, one of the questions I ask all the time, whether I'm working with a you know, the ITF groups, the coaches groups in countries is, you know, how many sets do your children play? And uh, most kids probably play about one or two sets a week. But if you look at a draw, let's just take, for example, a 64, you know, round draw. Let's just say the child's playing at 64. The parent and the child both are pretty sure that the kid's going to win the whole tournament, right? So in the, in the first round, the kid plays a three-set match. Next round, second round, two sets. Round of 16 is another three-set match. Now they're in the, um, you know, the quarters, two-set match. Semis, two sets. Finals, three sets. Okay, in, in the course of about five days, the child just played 15 sets, grueling, hard sets. And so you know, when, when we talk to the, the players and parents and coaches, when was the last time your players played 15 sets in a week? And they say, never. We played mm-hmm. one or two. But, but they right. think they're going to win titles, you know. And so there's a, another example of the disconnect of uh, of your point. That uh, they, they've got to play sets. And if, to me, if there's a time constraint, maybe start every set at 2-2 or start every game at 30-all. And you can get to the money part of the set, the, the competitive drama part of the set, faster. But I think you're right on. I think they need way more sets and a little less, um, just hitting back and forth. Right. And what's interesting, Frank, is, you know, we hear this all the time, you know, match play, match play, match play. When I was coming up in junior tennis, that's pretty much all we did. Um, you didn't take private lessons ever. Um, yeah. You know, we we showed up at the group and the coach said, okay, you two go play a match over here. You four go play a, a set of doubles and then, switch around, you know, I mean, and that was our practice every day. We don't see a whole lot of that anymore. And, you know, that kind of spurred me to, I started a Facebook group for match play, junior match play. And it's been, the group's been around for probably close to six months now, I would have to say. And there are a good number of people in the group. And every now and then I'll post on the group, how many of you, are using this group and actually setting up practice matches. And do you know not one person has done it? Not one. Oh, boy. And, I mean, I think there are probably like 250 members in the group now. So it's not that there aren't people, right? I mean, yeah. so, you know, as as the parent, I mean, first of all, match play is free unless you're having to pay for court rental, which, you know, hopefully everybody's got access to public courts. 
But other than, than paying to use the court, it's free to go out and play a practice match. <laughs> I, I yeah. don't but, get it. And go ahead. Well, it is. It's, just, it's human nature, isn't it? That we all do what we're comfortable doing. And um, but that's the difference between, you know, intermediate players and champions. Champions want to work on new things. They want to they want to conquer new issues. But most kids just want to do what they always do. They, they're comfortable doing it. And and I got to say, I'm, I'm I'm just as bad. I go to the gym and. I'm more comfortable lifting weights because I kind of feel more manly, but I should just get on the life cycle. <laughs> that, that's what I should be doing, but I don't. And if, I'm like, I'm an idiot. I'm just like, but but I, I think also with this whole idea about practice sets is that sometimes parents don't want to pay an academy. They're, well, I don't want to pay somebody just to have my kid go practice. But I think they're missing the boat because the uh, the really good academies don't just focus on winning or losing. You know, they, they have kind of like, I don't know, performance goals. So, for example, mm-hmm. I'll throw out a couple of just basic ones. If if you have the parents out there that are wanting their children to play practice sets, first thing is um, don't just consider the opponent's ranking, but consider their style of play. So if your child can't beat a moon ball pusher or retriever, try to book that style. Um, and, and another key I found success with is don't worry about booking another kid. If you're a high school player, if your kid's a high school player, book a college player, pay them 20 bucks and tell them to be the most annoying moon ball pusher for the whole match. That's way more meaningful than just playing a friend. Um, right. Because you can practice against a style you, you have trouble with. Um, so some topics might be how to beat retrievers, uh, play a match, how to beat hard-hitting baseliners, how to beat net rushers, uh, focusing only on your top patterns of play, um, focusing on spotting the opponent's top patterns. Um, and there's a there's a, a boat full of topics, but focus only on offense, neutral, and defensive shot selection. That's a great thing to focus on in real match play. Um, when I was coaching at the Australian Open, we did this panel discussion, and Tony Nadal was, was next. Whoa. Are you guys still there? What? We're here. <laughs> okay, good. That was a word. <laughs> but one of the Australian coaches asked Uncle Tony Nadal, um, what's the best part of Ross's game? Is it his speed, agility, focus? He said, no, it's his ability to only hit the shot the moment demands, which is shot selection. Um, All right, say that that's again. That's, that's a huge statement, Frank. Say that again. Yep. Well, Uncle Tony mentioned Rafa's greatest asset is he only hits the shot the moment demands. In other words, you don't see him doing anything reckless. But when, when we get on the court with nationally ranked players or sexually ranked players, most often their errors stem from reckless shot selection. They're, they're not abiding by the laws of offense, neutral, defense. You know what I mean? They're 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 going mm-hmm. offense when they should be when they should be neutral. Um, so shot selection that'd be a fun thing to work on with uh, with players. Um, I even like to have players work on. This sounds weird, I know, but changeover and between point rituals. Their internal and external well, I think rituals. It's huge. So That's huge yeah, because I mean, I mean, if if you if you videotape a match. And you break the tape down into time actually spent hitting the ball versus time spent between points and on changeovers. The second category far outweighs the first category. There's way more mm-hmm. time spent on changeovers and between points, right? So yeah. why do we why do we not focus ever on that? in the development process. I mean, it's it's rare to get a coach who addresses those things during clinics or private lessons. Well, I agree. I agree. And it, it is – the whole idea is you're not just controlling your backhand, but you're controlling your state of mind, you know, staying in that optimal performance state of mind versus sliding into over-arousal or under-arousal and – of course, now we're getting into more of the, you know, the sports psychology or the emotional side of competing. But 
I mean, let's face it when, it, when a match gets to a tipping point or now the match could go in either direction, it, it's really the person that can stay in their optimal state of mind and they're not panicking and overpressing and they're not, they're not choking and tightening up and thinking about the what ifs, like, you know, what if I win? What's my ranking going to go to? And, you know, what if I lose? Mm-hmm. What are my friends going to say? Where's the toilet going to go in my room? So that you know, their head is in the wrong place, really. And so it's not just about form. It's it's it's, it's a lot more to it, in my opinion. So anyway. Yeah. But these are all issues that you address in your book, right? Yes, they are. So that's, you know, we're talking about the competitive dramas. And there's so many of them. And if I can boil it down to one statement with this book, I really tried my hardest um, to have every page focus on one thing. It's um, I want the readers to understand that this book has everything they didn't even know they needed to know. They mm-hmm. don't even know the questions that they're going to have next year, but this already has the questions and the answers that they're going to have a year from now. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It, it's a big book for sure. Um, we dive into all the parental accountabilities and player accountabilities and we have a little bit of fun with different kind of like reality checks and pop quizzes and so um and then you mentioned of course the all the, all the interviews with we got some great coaches with within this um with within the book from you know Johan Creek who was a two time Australian Open champ and is a great coach. Um Nick Saviano. Sam Sumac and Coach Sazarenka, they're all providing their, you know, their insight. So, right, and and you have Peter Smith in there from USC, um, who, you know, if anybody knows how to win championships, it's him. And you know, I think there's some there's some really valuable information contained in the book. And it's not, I mean, I just want to say this to my listeners. It's not just Frank's opinion or Frank's experience that he's put down on paper. He has really enlisted input from some of the top people in the field, not just from the coaching side, but also, I mean, the fact that you include Stevie Johnson's dad, who, let's face it, Steve Johnson Sr. is a phenomenal coach. But even more than that, he's a phenomenal tennis parent. And yeah. his insights right are incredible. And, you know, I, he's been on this show um, a couple times, too. And I, I consider him a friend. And I, I learn something from him every time I'm in his presence. So, I, you know, the fact that, that you enlisted the input from these different people, I think, adds so much value to the book. And so I for for those who want to purchase a copy, Frank, how can they get their hands on it? Well, they can always go to my website, which is maximizingtennispotential.com. But um, but then again, with all the different Amazons and Barnes & Noble, pretty much any book outlet will be carrying the book. Um, regarding the we have a link to I, it I, on our site, too. Okay. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, we, yeah. Um, Stevie Johnson and Sam Corey both have nice interviews in the book too to give you give the readers the, the perspective of the player and you know why did they make it and and we, they talk about their parents and their parents' input and and uh, anyway so that was meaningful to me too to get that angle. Um, well, I think if there it's are important. US, and okay, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say just regarding the, the book and the link. If there are USPTA listeners out there, um, I am going to give the book away free, the ebook. Uh, it's, it's going to come out January 26th on the USPTA newsletter. So if you get the, uh, the newsletter, I think there's like 14,000 something, 12,000 USPTA pros from around the world that are going to get a copy of the book for free. So hopefully that will help, and we'll, we'll see, but. Um, and that's, anyway. that's great news for parents. I just want to point out, <laughs> it is it is great news for us as parents for the coaches to have this book as a resource because 
again, those of you who have been around Parenting Aces a while, you know, you've you've heard from some incredible coaches via this this radio show, and I've done some Q and A's on the website. Um, there are some incredible, incredible coaches out there, but there are also some really mediocre ones out there that need kind of I I mean I hate to say this, but they need a kick in the pants to <laughs> to up their game. Well, I mean they they do. I and and, and I think what? your I, book gives that. Well, thanks. I I've got to, I appreciate that. I I do. This is interesting for me, but I do believe that. The best way to improve the, those intermediate coaches um, is to educate the parents first because if the parents are educated on this whole process, they ain't going to be hiring intermediate lousy coaches anymore. They're going to go, wait, I know more about this process than my coach at the club. We're going somewhere else. And now mm-hmm. the pros are going to have to either get educated, get up to par, get up to snuff, or they're going to go extinct. So, right. Um, you know, us trying, that's why I don't try to educate coaches per se, because as you know, a lot of the coaches did play a little bit of ball. They played college, but their egos are so high. They know it all. <laughs> nobody, nobody can tell them anything. But if the parents are educated, that's a whole different story. It's well, going to be a game changer, I, I think. Right. Well, and and I think, you know, that's why we as parents, we hear a lot of coaches saying they don't want us hanging around. They don't want us involved in lessons and drill groups. They, you know, they don't want us calling them all the time. Um, now, the good ones do. The good ones seek the input from the parents and, and involve the parents and keep the parents apprised of, where their child is in, in the game plan, the development plan. And yeah. and I think you're you're absolutely right. And and honestly, I mean, you know, people have heard me say this a million times. I mean, that's why Parenting Aces exists. It's because there's no, you know, you, you're you doing parent education um, from the side of a, a tennis parent. Um, you, you have been a tennis parent yourself, but you're also a tennis coach. So you're coming at it from both sides. I'm I'm doing my little part just from the parent side and, you know, sharing all the ways that I've screwed up so that hopefully people don't make my same mistakes moving forward. But, you know, the, the underlying issue with all of this is junior tennis is only, it only lasts a finite amount of time. I mean, once that kid turns 19, junior tennis is over. And so if you've wasted three months or six months or, God forbid, two years with a mediocre coach, you don't get that time back. And it's like you said, it's like you said, Frank, I mean, you've seen these huge leaps in development when a kid gets with the right coach who is coaching the right things. So it's not rocket science. I mean, it really isn't. It's just having yeah. the right information delivered by the right person at the right time. Yeah, no, true. And it, it's really customized to the to the personality of, of the player. And that's that's probably one of the biggest issues is it's so much easier for a for a coach to pick a topic of the day and go teach the same topic to all eight lessons that day. Because they don't, they can go on automatic pilot and just cruise through the day. But I must say, is that in the best interest of the players? If if the players have issues that are X's and O's, working on other topics is that really maximizing potential at the fastest rate? And and it's probably not. So right. I, um, so anyway, what you you talk a lot about you know, the team around the player. I mean, that's that's one of your underlying yes. principles in, in everything I've ever read that you do. Um, and and the parent is is really, I mean, I, I almost hate to say this out loud, but the parent really is the team leader. I mean, because the parent well, yeah, drives who else is on the team, right? The parent's doing yeah, the hiring. Absolutely. 
the kid the needs CEO to be at the, the center of it. Yeah. Right. But the the kid needs to be at the center. But but the parent And that depends in, on in, the age, right? Sure. I mean you're if you're a parent of a nine year old compared to a seventeen year old and but uh, and the maturity level as well, because we uh, you know, you've seen it too. There's there's nine year olds that are way more mature than some seventeen year olds. So um it's kind of growth development schedule and maturity. But but I think you're right on. It's that the parent is the CEO of the whole project and they have to oversee their entourage of you know, mental emotional coaches, technical stroke sort of mechanical coaches, hitting partners, sparring partners, paid hitters, off court trainers, physical therapists. I mean, if you look at any top player, they they really do have an entourage, and uh, it's a disservice, folks. If you have a coach out there that says, I don't want you or your child talking to any other coach ever, I would just say dump that guy in a second because he's not after your <laughs> best, best interest. He's after his best interest, and that's that's mm-hmm. the truth. So, anyway. Well, well, let's let's do say this because I, I know there are some coaches out there who also are experts in the area of off court training, and or experts in the area of nutrition. Um, you know, may have a psychology background. Uh, I know my son worked with a coach who who had that background, and so got a lot of the mental and emotional stuff from the same person that was teaching the stroke mechanics, and and that yep. was awesome. Um, but in general, that's not the case. In general, you have specialists, just like any other area in in professional life these days. Everybody's got their specialty, and so identifying the right specialist. And and I mean, I I'm always hesitant to have this conversation, honestly, Frank, because I feel like somebody listening that's got a nine year old. Um, is going to say, oh, my God, you know, I'm getting ready to have to spend $500,000 in the hopes of my kid maybe earning some scholarship money down the road. And mm-hmm. I don't want to scare people off. And and I think that you you mentioned this earlier in today's conversation, you have to look at the age of the player and the stage of their development. So you're not saying that for a 9-year-old who's just getting started in the game – that it's necessary to hire all these experts. You're saying that as the child develops as a player and starts playing at the highest levels of the junior game, whether that's USTA tournaments or ITF tournaments, you know, in order to continue to progress, you have to start yeah. incorporating gradually these other specialists into their, into their game plan. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it is it's customized for sure. Um, and there's exceptions to every rule out there. But, but yeah, in, in the course of a – if a child is lucky enough to have a 10-year junior career, then in the course of 10 years going through the, uh, the levels of being sexually ranked or maybe nationally ranked or ITF ranked and then maybe even playing college, they're going to see all of those different types of coaches. Um, along that whole journey. But, I mean, if it's more of a beginning family, it, hiring a coach is just based on proximity. Just, you just got to find that club down the road and, you know, find the type of personality profile of a coach that you think will gel with your, with your junior. Some kids like drill sergeants. And some want, you know, happy-go-lucky, you know, warm and fuzzy type of coaches and, some want really detailed technical information. Some kids don't want the coach to talk at all. They're just like, just stand in front of me, shadow swing twice, and I'll copy it. That's the best coach for that certain kid. So um, finding the coach um, that fits is important. But, yeah, I don't, I don't really think you have to spend tons of money. But I, I do think that if the parent is not educated in the process, they are going to waste tons of money. Um, yes. <laughs> they're most likely to waste waste it. And to me, that's worse. But this whole process of trying to raise athletic royalty, there's so many uh, life skill benefits. Um, here's a, here's a, a goofy 
true life example. My my daughter now is 27. She was number one in the nation. She played the U.S. Open by 15, the adult U.S. Open. She was really into it. Well, she called me last week and said, you know, because of tennis, I made the biggest uh, – the biggest sales in our in my company that she's working for that anybody's ever made. She made a half a million dollar sale because because of resiliency and problem solving and I didn't take no for an answer. She goes, it was just kind of like a tennis match. So that's wow. important for parents to hear that right. you know, all these life skills that you're teaching, whether it's time management, anger management, organizational skills, all those things help the process of becoming a winner. And that process doesn't just help in tennis. It helps their whole life. Right. Really, that's it. We're, secret, we're secretly doing, doing that. You know, we want world-class adults, not just an 18-year-old tennis player, you know? Absolutely. So, you know, we're, we're coming down to the last few minutes of the show, and I, I want to make sure I touch on this because it's um, an important topic and that is when how does a parent know when to back off well burnout is a factor there, there's there's many 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 sides of burnout which that that is another chapter in this new book by the way is how to spot the different signs of burnout um i think a big part is listening to the to the athlete and and understand when you're you're hitting walls and you're not progressing anymore. Um, sometimes it is simply the parent has to back off because they're too close and that the child can still progress way farther. And um, that's one of the things that you'll hear from almost every great tennis parent. They, they know there's, certain, there's a certain time where they have to stop being uh, so involved and they have to walk away. Um, and sometimes it's because the parent is like a helicopter parent and they don't know it and they don't want to admit it, but they are. Um, to me, I've lately I've found some great success by asking parents really to, to back off. And we, we talk about this whole helicopter parent issue a lot, but one of the things that I found that was really cool was that sitting down, chatting with parents, we talk about, look, if you – solve the problem for the child and you solve it correctly, the child doesn't grow. You did it for them. There's no learning. There's no progress. If you try to solve the problem for the child and you do it wrong, now it's your fault. There's no learning. The child didn't progress. (laughs) So if you let the child solve the problem and they do it correctly, there's so much confidence, self-esteem, self-worth. They're growing. And even if you let the child solve it and they blow it, now they have to work on perseverance and problem-solving skills. So there's growth. There's growth even if they blow it. But uh, I encourage parents, you've got to let your children blow it. And that, I know that sounds silly, but that's where learning comes from. No, that's a huge from, message. You know? No, that's a huge message, Frank. And, and I mean, you and I both have adult children, and, and I, I see that even now, you know, with my adult children, that, um, they'll come to me for advice, and I have to be really careful not to try and fix it for them. Um, and it's hard, you know. We we want our children to be happy. We want them always to win and always to be successful. But we do them no favors by solving their problems, even if we do it correctly. Yeah. Like you said, there's no growth on their end, and that's we're not doing our job if if we're always stepping in and fixing everything. So. I, I think the burnout yeah. Yeah. question is, you know, it's always kind of at the back of parents' minds. If it's not at the back of your mind, parents that are listening, it should be because it's a really common occurrence. And I don't think it has to be a permanent thing, burnout. I think there are kids that take time away from the game and come back and come back stronger. Um, but I... I and I don't have any statistics to back this up, but I would guess that that more often than not, the kids that that do quit 
may not pick up a racket again ever, or if they do, it may be 20 years before they pick up a racket. And and to me, yeah. that's really sad. So, and there's there's no magic formula, right, to recognizing burnout. No, I think it's all customized for sure. Um, and there's a, there's there's a lot of factors that could cause burnout. But I got to say, probably the most common factor is improper training. It's preparing for tournaments improperly. Um, now, they, it's a, a great example, but if, if a junior player has their, their weekly developmental plan and they're touching every component, they're working on every component, and I use the analogy of like a computer. There's hardware and there's software. But the hardware of a junior tennis player is stroke mechanics, like primary, secondary strokes, and then movement, speed, agility, hardware. Software is mental and emotional. Well, look, if you're only working on stroke mechanics, you're not even preparing properly for a tournament. And now the kid loses, 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 loses. Guess what? They want to quit. Well, burnout could have been, could have been solved if the parent and the coach and the entourage and the player, if they had a smarter developmental plan. So whenever I, I get with parents and they talk about their child is, is kind of burning out, we go real deep. We talk about, well, why? Well, my kid loses to a moon ball pusher every tournament and she can't handle it. And we talk about, okay, well, what's, what's the developmental plan? What does she do? Well, she goes to her academy and they hit mini tennis. Then they hit cross court back and forth to each other hard. Then they hit cross court the other way back and forth hard. And, but we talk about, well, are they working on patterns to diffuse moon ball pushers? No. Are they working on their <laughs> endurance and agility to play a three a three set match? No. Are they working on emotional muscle? No. Well, there you go. So now we right. actually we change the, the whole plan and get the kids happier than than anything. Now they're like so excited to go to the court because now they see the light at the end of the tunnel. And burnout is just sometimes it's just poor coaching. I hate to say it, right. but. Well, and it can also be boredom, right? I mean, it, well, yeah, it's just really boring. You go out there and you know exactly what the next two hours are going to look like. I'm going to do five minutes of this, and I'm going to do ten minutes of that, and it's the same day in and day out, day in and day out. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, anybody would get sick of that. Yeah, and, that, but, and so now we're talking about what's causing burnout, and sometimes it's maybe coaches that are not progressing. They're not adding, you know, that – one of the things that I that I um, well I won't mention one country. I was just in a, in a country, and they're still doing this old school academy issue where they call it bump up or bump down. And you, you've probably seen it in Atlanta too. But they have the kids play, and if they win, they move up to the cool group, and if they lose, yeah. they go down to the to the dogs. Well, that stunts all the growth that a parent and player seeks. Because look, honestly, if the, if the kid has to work on coming in and knocking off a swing volley or his, his or her short angle game to get a pusher off the court, well, they're not even going to attempt those things because if they miss it in practice, they go down to the, the dogs. So they don't even try it. So now all of a sudden, we're paying good money for kids to be in junior programs, and they're not progressing at all because they're scared. They want to go up to the good group, but they're only going to do what they know how to do. They're not going to work on anything new, which they need to increase their tool belt to, to maybe be the pusher retriever. So right. we have that issue. that We have that conversation all the time with the heads of big tennis federations that we have to change the way we're, you know, we're, we're approaching this coaching animal, you know? Right. Well, we're down to our last minute mm-hmm. or so, Frank. So I just want to make sure, again, that we – Say the name of the book, which is Tennis Parents Bible. It's the second edition. It is now available to all of us for purchase, and it's available in bookstores, online outlets, through Frank's website, which, again, Frank, give your website one more time. Yeah, it's MaximizingTennisPotential.com. If you, and if you, and the listeners, if you um, email us through the site, let us know you heard this, we'll We'll also throw out two free ebooks, like 
how to attract a college scholarship or the, the match chart collection. So yeah, mention this, mention this um, blog talk radio show and uh, we'll give you two free books as well. When you purchase the uh, oh. tennis print Bible. How's that? Awesome. That's fantastic. Nobody. Thank you, Frank yeah. and parenting Ace as listeners. I hope you will take advantage of that. I, I have taken advantage of it in the past, and, and I have several of Frank's books, and they are very, very valuable tools. So, Frank, thank you so much for being with us this week, and um, I, I really appreciate no, it. I wish you all the success with the book and um, look forward to me, to the next one. No, thank you. Let me quick just say that um, I'm going to be in North Carolina at the USTA conference January 22nd and in Minnesota at the USPTA conference January 28th, if any uh, listeners are in that neck of the woods, okay? Fantastic. Come say hi. Best of luck. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. To my listeners, to my listeners, thank you for tuning in today. I hope you've learned something new from Frank Giampaolo and that you'll check out the latest edition of Tennis Parents Bible. You can find a link to it on our website as well, parentingaces.com. Just click on the books link and you'll see it there. All right. Have a great week, everybody. I'll see you next week on Parenting Aces. <laughs>